Alright. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to give probably quite a different, uh, it, quite a different perspective on uh, the European Paleolithic than what we just heard from uh, Julian. Um, I should probably give a little bit of personal history before I start because I did all my uh, upper, I did all my third level education in the UK, but the majority of work that I've done has actually been out in Eastern Europe. And in the last two and a half years, I've been based in France. So I can't really claim to belong to any particular school. And what I want to present to you today is not actually particularly data heavy, but it's uh, to do with um, a particular theoretical approach and a particular methodology within that approach. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is typology, which I realize sometimes people say mean things about. It's, you know, it really does have a bad name in the study of the Paleolithic. And I can understand why that is, because there has been a lot of really bad typology done in the Paleolithic. Um, I have absolutely no disagreement with that perspective. Um, and I think where it is acknowledged as having some value, it's often just seen as a precursor to applying other approaches. Um, but for me personally, uh, it has a lot of value as a, as a principal research approach, as a principal methodology, and I'm hoping in this, in this uh, presentation to explain why I believe that. Um, typology is the study of types. Typology is not anything more or less than that. Um, it's, it's not a it's not a prescriptive way of looking at the, the archaeological record it's it's just a, a concentration on types of when we when we're talking about lithic typology when it's the study of lithic uh lithic tool lithic tool types generally speaking um and they can tell us an awful lot i don't think that lithic types are worth studying for their own sake they're only worth studying because we have certain research questions that they can help us to answer and the research question that I'm most interested in, in my own work, is uh, to do with how we build and rebuild, revise and criticize our chronicultural framework. So the cultural taxonomy that we use in the Upper Paleolithic, the, the, the units that we use to describe and analyze the archaeological record. Um, and this is a really important task, I think, for archaeologists. It's a really interesting thing to study. And lithic typology gives us a really useful way to do quite a lot of this work. Some people talk about technotypology. This is a word that, as far as I know, comes directly from the French uh, technotypology. And I suppose the, the increasing use of that, word, of that word is to emphasize the incorporation of technological information into our typological definitions and descriptions. Um, me, personally, I'm just going to talk about typology in this talk because you know, to me, it's, to me, it's the same thing. To me, typology has always incorporated technological information. Um, so I don't really think there's a very strong distinction to be made there. The theoretical underpinnings that I use in my work are as follows. Number one, all assemblages are similar. Number two, all assemblages are different. And I'm not just trying to be funny here. I think, I think it's, it's kind of important because if you compare any two assemblages from the Upper Paleolithic, you can find similarities between them, and you can also find differences. And that's important because if you're interested in looking at similarities and differences within the archaeological record, and to, to try and find some structure in that record, to try and find some patterning in that record, you need to have a little bit of context for what these similarities and differences mean. And for me, if you're studying the European Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic, you need to consider the, entire, the entirety of that record as your context. And so if you're looking for meaningful similarities, if you're looking for the similarities that actually tell you something about cultural similarities in the past, there are two criteria that, they, that those similarities need to fulfill. First of all, they should be restricted in space and time. And secondly, they should be coherent in space and time. And what I mean by that is that certain types we know occur over and over again in the Upper Paleolithic record. If you just take, for example, burins as a general category, they, the, the presence or absence of, of burins does not tell you very much about how similar two assemblages are in the Upper Paleolithic. 
So what we are really interested in the, is the features that are restricted. Um, and so this, this goes straight away to the study of types. We're looking for types that are restricted in the archaeological record. So if, for example, vector per cable appearance, on the other hand, are restricted. Their, their shared presence in numerous sites you know, probably tells us something about uh, salient similarities between those sites. But we're also interested in geographically and temporally coherent features. And the reason for that is that we are looking for similarities that are the, pro the, the product of social processes, the product of cultural transmission between groups either through time or through space. So um, what we want is uh, groups, of, groups of assemblages that share a certain feature. If you find the same feature in two groups of sites or three groups of sites that are very distant, either in time or in space, we're probably looking at the products of convergence. Now, all of that, I think, is pretty, I think it's pretty safe. I think that's all pretty um, well accepted, I hope, what I've said. But this then, this then is the, I suppose, the background that I'm using to come back to lithic typology. So for me, there are three stages to doing lithic typology, to studying these types in the archaeological record. First of all, you want to identify the types that fulfill those criteria that I just talked about. Then you want to try and work out a definition of those types that is clear, and I mean extremely clear, but also minimal, so that it, it does enough work to define that type, to do the work that you want it to do, to um, find similarities in the archaeological record, and no more. And then third, you want to describe those types. You want to consider the variation that you find uh, within them. And obviously, there's a little bit of back and forth that you can get between definition and description, because as you find more, as you find more lithics that um, conform to your definition, you might find that the variation is not quite as you originally seemed. You can go back to it. Now, the definitions of types can include morphological, dimensional, and technological information. So that's the information about the lithics themselves. But it can also include temporal and ge geographical information. So what I mean by that is that this is to get around that problem of, of convergence that I talked about before. So if you have two groups of lithics that you think are not actually connected culturally, um, but which in fact can be described using exactly the same definition, you want to include temporal and geographical information in order to separate them in the archaeological record. Why lithic typology? Because it facilitates large-scale comparisons. So I work in Central and Eastern Europe mainly, and there's an awful lot of work to be done out there in terms of getting our heads around the um, taxonomy of the sites, the taxonomy of the assemblages. Um, and if I were to go around and try and apply a detailed technological analysis to every single one of those sites, I would never finish my PhD. So this is, I think, the, the real power of lithic typology that you can you can start to get a first approximation of this chronocultural framework very quickly. I'm also going to assert that there is no a priori reason why it should be less informative than purely technological approaches. There are a few other aspects of the type of archaeology that I've mainly worked on that are um, particularly um, relevant to why I think typology is, has been the most appropriate method to use. Um, so first of all, it allows for work in old collections, where often the debitage is nowhere to be seen if it was ever properly excavated and recorded in the first place. And also because in many of the regions where I work, there are very strong differences in raw material availability that really stymies technological approaches. So if you have one site where people were using river cobbles to nap, and you have another site you know, 50 kilometers away where people were using um, beautiful nodules of flint to, to nap, it, it's very difficult to do a fair, typological, uh, fair technological comparison of them. But typological approaches can still help you to see some of the similarities that are there. Now, I want to give two examples of why, of, 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 of how I think um, this typological approach helps to build a chronocultural framework, helps to get insights into the archaeological record. The first one is to do with um, these, this 
very recently defined index fossil called Elemon Beach Ponke or Lake Gravettian Rectangles. Um, it was defined twice in the space of um, one year in two different um, articles. And these, art these artifacts are found at sites across Central and Eastern Europe, dating to um, sort of the middle of the mid upper Paleolithic. And they're very, very distinctive, um, a very, very distinctive group of artifacts. Um, very rectilinear <coughs> backed bladelets with inverse retouch to both ends, um, either rectangular or rounded ends, and mostly quite small. And these have been described at numerous different sites now. And also, so if I look at um, some of the work that other people have done, some of the work that I've done, and then also just go by going through the literature, you can see that the distribution of these sites looks probably something like this, although there's you know, quite a, a fair bit of checking that needs to be done for, cert for certain, ones, certain of the sites. Why is this interesting? Why, why does this matter? Because if you know anything about um, the study of Gravettian archaeology in Central and Eastern Europe, you'll know that shoulder points have long been recognized as being found only in Central and Eastern Europe at this time period. Um, this is a really you know, well understood, well studied um, group of artifacts that have a very distinctive distribution. But because it looks like the uh, late Gravettian rectangles are slightly older in many cases than the shoulder points, it suggests that this separation that you get between Western Europe on the one hand and Central and Eastern Europe on the other hand actually existed before these shoulder points appeared. Um, so for me, who's interested in building up a, a framework of the, the Paleolithic across Europe, this is, you know, this is interesting, this is important. The second example that I want to give you is to do with um, Anasovka points, which are, which are most, much less well-known lithic artifact type. These are quite a bit later than the artifacts I was talking about before. They're backed points that are surprisingly specific in, in um, their technology. Despite, I mean, you can, you can define them quite, quite simply, but they are very restricted in, in space and time. They look a lot like fader mesa points. Um, some people have described them, in fact, as fader mesa points or as azillion points. But they're, they're much earlier, and they're from a, a different uh, region. And so I think this is where the, the distinction I was talking about before, about the importance of bringing in geographical and temporal information, <coughs> really comes into play. Um, they're really cute. Often the blanks are reversed. Sometimes they use like a hinge fracture as the base. They're really nice. Um, and they're found in a much smaller area than the, than the rectangles or the shoulder points that I was just talking about. And so what you can see here, looking at the results of this type of this um, typological study, is perhaps the beginnings of um, a picture of fragmentation around the late uh, around the last glacial maximum. This is just a, you know this is one very small part of the picture in Europe, but this is I think perhaps where it's going. So. Typology to me remains an absolutely vital approach. I mean, people dismiss it very often, but I, I, I think it has so much to teach us if we're trying to study the kind of questions that I'm interested in, if we're trying to revise the chronocultural framework for Europe, which to me urgently um, needs doing. There are certain things that I think we can improve in the way that we commonly do typology. Chronological work does remain vital getting decent um, dates on any of these sites is very important so that we can you know, get some, uh, a strong basis for the comparisons that we're making. I think the definitions that we use typologically, they, think they need to be so clear, they need to be so explicit. There shouldn't be too much room for interpretation as to whether or not a, an artifact belongs to a type or not. Um, beyond that, we need fuller description. We need all sorts of numbers, percentages, all different ways that we can think of of describing these these types, the, the artifacts themselves, the specific artifacts, um, morphologically and technologically. With illustration, there are so many different 
methods that are available to us, we need to be taking advantage of all of them. And also, we just need a lot more data sharing. I, really, I, I would really like to see a lot more people sharing the actual data that they use to reach their conclusions in their articles. And then finally, there's all sorts of different things we could be doing with this typological information. So not only bringing in the results from technological work, but also looking at, you know, if we, if we try to study the same group of sites using personal ornaments, using mobiliary art, for example, how does that look? Where, you know, where does that get us? Where does the tension between the results that we get from all these different um, approaches, where does that get us? And that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you.